Good morning. Good to see y'all this morning. Good to see y'all's bright and shiny faces and all those wonderful coats and jackets and first hoodie sighting of the year. So that's always a good thing. Welcome today to worship. Uh, we're proud to have y'all with us. Uh, just one announcement. want to make sure that you all remember the special offering this week is for Wellroot, the uh, former United Methodist Children's Home. So uh, please be in prayer about that offering this week. And as uh, we gather for worship here today, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this opportunity to come together and be in worship. We come hungry this morning, Lord, hungry this morning for your word and your presence. We ask that this music and this message might feed and nourish us, that we might go forth in this week and be a blessing to all those we encounter. We ask these things in the most beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. If you have your bulletin this morning on your phone via email, the first song this morning is Waymaker. Darkness, my God, that is who you are. 
pray, Holy Spirit, that your presence and power will go before us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome job, guys. Thank you so much. It's good to be in worship with you again today, and it is different to have our coats on today. The kind of fall is here, and uh, we will enjoy the fall as much as we can. I do want to let you know that we will be getting kind of our leadership team together in the next couple of weeks to try to figure out when things get too cold out here, what other options we might do inside. And uh, so just keep our leadership folks in prayer as, uh, as we consider that. But uh, one of the things we look forward to is homecoming Sunday next Sunday with the Reverend Jenny Fletcher Anderson. And uh, it's going to be great to welcome Jenny back with us and uh, to have her family with us too. And so we hope that you will come out and prepare to sit on the lawn again with us next week. And hopefully it'll be a, just a bit warmer next Sunday. Uh, but uh, it's good to be with you guys this week. As we prepare for our time of prayer today, um, we do want to remember just all the things going on, the wildfires out in California, the folks that have had lots of things washed away by the torrential rains of the hurricane. Um, also keep in prayer Celeste Lawrence and her family. Uh, Larry Lawrence's funeral will be next Sunday afternoon and uh, it'll be at Hastings Memorial Service. Uh, so uh, keep Celeste and her uh, girls in your prayer too. Any other prayer requests today? Okay. If you'll join me then, let's... Uh, Let's join together our hearts for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you that you are our way maker. Lord, we thank you for the sun shining down on us to just warm our hearts and lives, to help us celebrate your amazing power, creator God. Lord, I just pray that your creative power would be at work in us today to awaken us, to bring us life, to help us live more fully for you. Lord, where we have allowed darkness and sin to cloud our hearts and lives, we pray today for your mercy and grace and forgiveness. We pray that we might put ourselves in you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you might lead and guide our steps, that you might help us uh, live vitally for you, help us find ways to love our neighbors as you've loved us. 
Father God, we pray for healing of the sick in our midst. We continue to lift up those with cancer and pray for their healing in Jesus' name. We pray for others who are grieving the death of, of family and relatives like Celeste Lawrence and her family. We pray, Holy Spirit, bring your comfort to them. Father God, we pray as well just for what's going on in our nation. We lift up California and Oregon and Washington, oh God, and pray that you might bring rain to quench the fires out there and uh, to save lives and to help draw your people back to yourself. Oh God, we pray for those who are undergoing the loss and destruction from the hurricanes the last several weeks as well. And pray that your Holy Spirit will help us uh, and help them rebuild their lives and uh, Lord that you go before them and help them find hope in you and help us be a, a, a vessel of hope for them as well. Oh God as you call us uh, to love our neighbor, as you call us to be at work for good in this world, we pray your Holy Spirit will do a new work in our community and nation for your glory. Uh, Lord, let your spirit of revival awaken us and awaken your church in vital ways, awaken your community in vital ways to reach new people with the good news of Jesus and his death and resurrection. Lord, let your power dwell in our hearts and lives today and always. Lord, let your mighty power be at work giving wisdom to our leaders, uh, caring, O oh God, for our military and police and firefighters. Lord, help bringing about a spirit of unity and uh, uh, care and grace where there is hurt and division, especially over racial struggles. Lord, we pray that you will be at work doing new things in our nation for your glory in Christ's name. And Father God, as you're at work in us, we pray be at work in our world. Give us hearts for the poor, for the broken, for those whose lives are shattered by war, those who are refugees, those who are hungering and thirsting for a relationship with the creator of the universe all over this planet. Help us have missionary hearts that want to see you lifted up and your glory taken forth to the very ends of the earth. And then help us put our feet and our lives to doing good in your name. Father, we pray this in the glorious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will you worship with us uh, with singing quietly as our band leads us in our next song? Before we start our worship song, I just want to take a second to um, thank Buster for coming out today and being with us and to especially thank the band. They get here so early and set up all this equipment. They never complain. And I'm just so proud to be a part of this wonderful worship team. And I know you all appreciate them too. So this is Holy Spirit. Please sing with us.
Today we wrap up our series on Paul's five keys to unleash your life. So pop quiz today, you know, one last time. Let's go over these five keys together. The first one was to place your life on God's altar. Place your life on God's altar. The second one was to take the gifts God has given you and get in the game. Take the gifts God has given you get in the game. The third was to center your life in the love of God. Center who you are, your life in the love of God. The fourth last week was be a force for good, a countercultural force for good against evil. And then today's, the last one we're going to look at is put on the Lord Jesus and wake up. Put on the Lord Jesus and wake up. For this, we turn to uh, chapter 13 of Romans. And at the end of chapter 13, starting in the 11th verse, Paul writes these words. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. 
Let us behave decently and honorably as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, but rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Can you pray with me? Holy Spirit, I ask for your help today. Lord, help us to open ourselves more. Help us to wake up more to what you're up to in this present season. And Lord, guide our steps to be clothed in your armor and follow you more closely. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, as I've been praying over this this last week, and it, I've had some conversations with Andrea too, uh, what God has laid on my heart is really starts with that first question, that, or really the first statement Paul makes, and do this understanding the present time. Do this understanding the present time. Um, th that word present time there in the Greek is the word kairos. There are a couple of different words the Greek used to talk about time. The most familiar one is chronos, where we get chronology. But there's a second word kairos, and that's what the word that's used here, which theologians say refers more pointedly to God's time, what God is up to. Be aware of what God is up to right here, right now in the present so that we don't miss out on the new things he wants to do. And, and as in light of that, to, to, to take ourselves from a state of sleep and snoozing and being content and relaxed and uh, focused on ourselves, to being awake and alert for our salvation is near. Now here in this letter, Paul is, has been teaching the Roman church, a, a church he did not plant, a church he has never met. And so it's been a quite a long letter. He was, he's been building his case in terms of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to repent of our sin and brokenness, what it means to place our life on God's altar and unleash that life for his glory. And so he's been trying to convince this church in Rome to wake up, wake up, quit, quit being asleep. Now is the right season. Now is the proper time. Now is, is what God is up to and how he's moving and all those things. And if we don't wake up, we're going to miss it. Um, I love the Methodist church. Uh, it was my grandparents' church, the church that first nurtured me when I didn't know a whole lot about Jesus and didn't know anything about the Bible. Well, not much hardly at all. It was the church that uh, nurtured me as a teenager as I grew my faith and uh, was involved in ministry with a high school choral group called The Basics. And we went around and toured and that began to disciple me and shape my faith uh, in significant ways. And it's the church I've known all my life. It's the church I love. I love uh, the stories of John and Charles Wesley. I love how the Holy Spirit worked in their lives to build a movement of followers of Jesus who, who just sought to share Christ with their friends and neighbors and not just in this town. If they were in this town, they'd go to the next town. And, and uh, soon little churches began to pop up all over England and all over the United States in the early days. We were at such an incredible and vital movement from about 1770 to, uh, eight, to 1860. For about 100 years, we grew faster Christians, made more disciples for Jesus than anybody else in the United States for about 100 years. For the next 100 years, we kind of became an established church. We, that grew wealthy and prosperous and we continued to grow some but it it wasn't a movement anymore it was an established church 
Then in the 70s, we kind of went from being an established church to a slowly stagnant and dying church. And that's always kind of dug at me a little bit. I don't know if it digs at you, but, you know, because I've, in ministry, one of the reasons I got into this is because, God, I want to see you do something new. I want to see you do something incredible. I want to see you transform hearts and lives. I want to see you make disciples. I want to see you redeem. I want us to be awake. But it seems like as a denomination, as we go along, in little ways, somehow, some way, we're falling asleep. And uh, where I fear, and I don't have all the answers, but one thing I fear is, is we're having a hard time connecting, especially with the unchurched and dechurched, but also we're having a hard time connecting with the younger generations. And that also concerns me deeply. Um, and I don't, you know, as I said, I, I don't know how to fix it, but I know we need to wake up. John, John Wesley put it this way, you know, one of his more famous quotes that, uh, that he feared would come and kind of knew would come. Uh, Wesley said this. He said, I'm not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America. You know, uh, Methodists will always be here, he thought. But I am afraid, lest they should only exist as a dead sect. Having the form of religion without the power. And this undoubtedly will be the case. John Wesley had the foresight to say, this is going to happen. Unless they hold fast to the doctrine the spirit and the discipline with which they first set out. Unless they hold fast to the teaching, the spirit, and the discipline with which they first set out. And, and Wesley's words have been prophetic for our denomination over the last 40, 50 years. We find ourselves where we're struggling to connect with the next generation. Um, in my own family, you know, we, all my, I've got three, a brother and two sisters. Of the four of us, we were all raised in the Methodist Church. We were all active in youth group and Sunday school and all that. Uh, we were all involved in our youth choir, which was probably one of the most vital things we did as a youth ministry to make disciples of teenagers. And uh, of my brother and two sisters, of the four of us, I'm the one United Methodist. Now, don't get me wrong, my brother and sisters are all passionate about their faith in Jesus. It's just they didn't find in the United Methodist Church a place that embraced and welcomed that passion. For whatever reason, things didn't connect for them, that, that this is a place where I can be a valiant disciple of Jesus where I can be unleashed for the world in ways for his glory that will make an impact for the kingdom they just they didn't connect with it in the Methodist Church and so they are vital Christians in other denominations and now with our own kids you know we've got four awesome kids who have awesome hearts for Jesus but we're beginning to see the same things uh, you know, and it's still too early to tell, but, our, you know, our two college girls are passionate about Jesus Christ, and we're so excited about that. But they don't have the love, I think, of the Methodist Church that I do. And that, that hurts my heart some. Uh, because it says we're failing to connect. And, and I don't know what it is, but, uh, you know, even here... At the Methodist Church, we've had strong youth ministry, strong children's ministry. You know, our staff, you guys are doing a great job. This isn't a critique of staff or anything like this. This is it's more of a critique of our entire culture as Methodists. We've kind of gotten comfortable as Methodists, and it's comfortable in a way that, that I'm, I fear some of our younger generation looks at it and says, is our faith really real? 
But does it really make a difference? Or is it just something we do on Sundays? And then, uh, and then others who are more passionate about Jesus come along and they say, well, you know, it's gotten me this far in the Methodist church, but there are these non-denominational churches out there who can take my faith further. The, the worship and, and everybody singing passionately to the Lord is more vibrant and, and it's more exciting and, and uh, more connecting and more intimate and, and the small groups are more nurturing and, you know, and so I struggle. You know, our, our model is based on the 1950s and 60s model of Sunday school and worship, and, and it was a great model for the 40s, 50s, and 60s. But it's, it's not connecting as well with those my age and younger. Now, y'all have had a lot of success with the younger generation. I don't want to ignore that at all. Jenny Anderson coming back to be with us next week is an example of that. Will Zant, who was here with us last year, is an example of that. Uh, Wayne Phillips' son is an example of that. Uh, there are still, y'all have done a great job discipling a lot of youth and a lot of younger people, but, but somehow, some way, in this season, uh, we've got to be aware of what God is up to today. We've got to be aware that maybe in some areas we're falling asleep. And we need to hear Paul's call once again to unleash our lives for his glory in new ways that can help us connect with the younger generation and can help us make disciples for Jesus. So, you know, uh, for instance, I mean, we... We have, uh, one of the first things I did when I got here is we tried to do more with our young adult group, and we have done more with our young adult group. You know, there's been times where it's gone pretty well, and there's been times where it's not gone quite as well. Um, but it's a hard group to reach. But, but right now, we have a lot of college-age young adults who are going to Gordon, and they're close by, and all those things. You know, but when, when we talk about it with them about are you excited about your faith? Are you excited about being a part of worship or being a part of church? You know, sometimes I hear the answer, well, we'd love to go out and eat dinner together and get together as friends, but eh, church. Eh. And, uh, and I know part of that's probably normal, but, uh, but I long to do better. And so these words from Paul really kind of spoke to my heart as we wrap this up. You know, Paul is calling us to unleash our lives for his glory. And he gives us the keys for that, and, and that is to learn how to separate our lives from the darkness, to live more fully in the daylight. You know, darkness is that place or that season or that time or those choices where we do things that we're ashamed of, where we get involved in stuff that's harmful, uh, where, it, and I don't know, I mean, we're all good folks, I'd say, but even for good folks, maybe it's just darkness can be settling for apathy rather than vibrancy, settling for sleep rather than being awake. And so Paul calls us to get rid of the apathy, get rid of the sleep, get rid of the darkness, and, and come into the light. And he gives us three examples of darkness to, to watch out for. He says, you know, behave decently and honorably as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness. Uh, I think a more modern translation might say, you know, not in partying and drinking, you know. Uh, the, the, uh, the temptation of the of the trouble of the socialite. The temptation of the trouble of the socialite. My life is just one big party. And, uh, you know, my fun, my friends are all at the party. And Paul warns us that parties often comes crashing down. Uh, it can lead us into addictive behaviors. It can, uh, it can lead us to brokenness in other ways. And so he says, watch out for the life of the party. The second area, he says, 
not in sexual immorality or debauchery. And here he warns us of the trouble of uh, looking for sexual experiences outside of the marriage relationship. Looking for sexual experiences outside the marriage relationship. And he says in these, this way, this, the sexual part of who we are is one of the most sacred parts of being a human being. Let me say that again. The sexual part of who we are is one of the most sacred parts of our lives as human beings. And, uh, and how we handle the sexual part of who we are can make a huge impact on the whole of our lives. The whole of, and so Paul warns us about sexual brokenness and trying to find life in a wide variety of sexual experience outside of marriage. Then the third thing he says is not in, in dissension and jealousy. And here he warns us of the trouble of a bitter heart. He warns us of the trouble of a bitter heart. Bitter heart, this angry heart that leads to broken relationships, that leads to not being able to maintain friendships or maintain a relationship with our spouse or with our kids or with our coworkers or wherever. Uh, but a bitter, angry heart, Paul warns us. A jealous heart, Paul warns us, can bring trouble to our life and relationships where we fail to make the most of it. And so in all these things, he says, instead, put on the armor of light. Do those things that you won't be ashamed of. Live in a way that you won't be ashamed. Live in the way so that when your kids and your grandkids look at your life and how you live, they see a real, authentic passionate faith in Jesus. You know, our, our kids are really good at, uh, I don't know, I think they have a high level of, I don't, I don't know any other way to say this, a, a BS meter, right? They can sense when we fake it. They really can. They sense when, yeah, when mom and dad takes us to church, but it's not really all that important. Uh, you know, they can sense when we, when we hear living one way at church and then we go live one way at home. And uh, so it's just so important, Paul says, to live honestly in the daylight in a way that when your kids look at you and your grandkids look at you, they look at you in a way that says, I want to be like that. I see them go to church and be excited about worship and excited about growing in their faith. And I, I see them reading their Bibles every day. And I, I see them wanting to get closer to God. And I see them on their knees in prayer. And I, I see them guiding us in how to pray around the kitchen table. And I see all this stuff. And I want that too because there's a power to that. There's a passion to that. There's a love to that. There's something unique to that that I can't get at the party and I can't get uh, by going and looking around for sexual experiences and I can't get it by letting bitterness and anger be in charge of my heart. Isn't that the kind of people, that, you know, that's who I want to be. I think that's who you want to be too. And somehow, some way, we live in a generation where as Methodists, We've got to recover some of those things. We've got to recover a, a more passionate way of worshiping God that gets us excited. So if you have any ideas about that, you can let me know or let Teresa know. You know, we have to, have to develop a vital life of prayer where we're comfortable praying with our kids or with our grandkids and modeling for them what what community prayer looks like. And I know some folks say, you know, I can never pray out loud. But I ask you, could you maybe try it, if not for your sake? I know you're scared to death. It's fine to be scared to death, but could you not maybe try it for your grandkids? You know? To say, yes, I'm scared to death, but I'm going to show you I'm going to get out of my boat. I'm going to wake up and express my faith in a way that see it's real for me, maybe in a way that I haven't shared before. And so, uh, and with discipleship, to find ways we 
may have to find new ways to do discipleship. I, I, I've tried to bring more small groups to our church here at Jackson, and we have you know, a, a handful of vital small groups. But, uh, but for whatever reason, uh, the small group model tends to work better with our generation and younger than the Sunday school model. And we've got great Sunday schools here. I mean, Lucia, y'all do an awesome job. Our other Sunday schools do a great, I'm not critiquing our Sunday schools, but, but it's not reaching our younger generation as well. And, uh, and we've got to find ways to, to do something different. You know, Jesus used to say it this way. He said, listen, there's old wine skins that were made to be filled with old wine. And there's new wine skins that if you put old wine in the new wine skin, it's not going to work. And if you put new wine into the old wine skin, the old wine skin is going to burst. You've got to find new wine skins in order to hold the new wine. And y'all, I think uh, what's been stirring in my heart is, Lord, what do we need to do? How do we need to live? How do we need to grow our faith and culture in a way that we can be new wineskins for the next generation? How can we, you know, we may have to say um, reaching the next generation is primary and we are willing to do whatever we need to differently in order to do that. And if it means changing when contemporary service is and when traditional service is, or if it means doing this, or if it means doing that, then if it means getting more of you guys who have the gift of teaching and discipling, try to find ways to get you plugged in to mentoring youth or working with children or working with our young adults, you know, that, that we'll find ways to do that. So anyway, uh, Paul's final word to us, though, and this is the good news, is learn how to clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And ultimately, that's what all this is about, is that when we clothe ourselves in Jesus, when Jesus becomes my Lord, my King, my Master, and my identity, um, you can't help but change. You can't help but be a new creation. You can't help but have your heart filled with his love. You can't help but have your heart strangely warmed, as Wesley said 300 years ago happened to him. You can't help but be different. And so today, let us clothe ourselves with Jesus in a way that we're sensitive to the season, in a way that we say, Lord, if we're asleep at all, if our Methodist movement has turned in any way, shape, or form, even a little bit into a dead sect, God, help us not stay there. You know, because we, we want to be alive for you. Um, I, I close with this last comment. This year, United Methodists, I, we plan as a United North Georgia conference, 900 or so churches. We planted one or two churches, maybe. We closed 24. We planted one or two. We closed 24. And of those 24, they weren't just the little bitty churches with 10 people in it. They closed churches that were in suburban Atlanta that 20 and 30 years ago were vibrant and filled and alive. I know our, our Ruth and Buster Brown uh, one of their churches they grew up in was one of those churches. Um, and, uh, and it's sad to see. And so my heart as your pastor is, is now is the time for us to wake up. Ten years from now, it will be too late. Let me say that again. Ten years from now, it very well, it could be. Ten years from now, it could be too late. So let's clothe ourselves with Jesus, and Lord, wake us up. Amen? Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray today that you'll help us. If we are asleep at all, come Holy Spirit and wake us up. Help us have a new vision of disciple-making. 
that puts you at the heart, that we center our lives to be clothed with you from top to bottom, to make you the identity of who we are. And in that vision, Lord, help us center ourselves on those who don't know Jesus, those who are disconnected from church, and those of the younger generation. And Lord, show us a way to make disciples for your glory so that you may continue to use us as a movement for your glory for the next 300 years. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Will you please just repeat after me? Lord, make me the flame. Lord, make me the flame. I think we can do a little better. Lord, make me the flame. Lord, make me the flame. That ignites our church this year. That ignites our church this year. If you could pray that every night, if you could pray that every day, that you become the part. It's up to us. Our church is up to us. It's in our hands. We can all do it, but we got to pray. Can you do that for me? For Chris? Whatever you feel that our church is needing, pray for that each day. And we'll see miracles happening, I believe. We're ending with Open Up the Heavens. Please stand as we sing this last song.
the Lord. Amen. And, and the good news is God is a God who answers. Uh, I told you Paul sent this message to a Roman church he did not know. Apparently they must have said yes. They must have awoken because Rome became the heart of the Christian faith for 1,500 years after that. For 1,500 years when, when the church looked for truth, when they looked for vibrancy, when they looked for life, they looked to Rome. And even now, 2,000 years later, Rome still has a huge part to play in the Christian faith. And it shows the impact that can be made when we wake up and say, Lord, we want to be a part of that too. And uh, so let's go be that kind of people for God's glory here in Butts County and all around the world. Go in the love of a father who wants his best for us, wants his best for our world. Go in the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ. Clothe yourself in the Lord Jesus. Die to the darkness in his death. Be raised to new life in the Holy Spirit in his life. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, may you live for his glory as in the beautiful daylight we have in a way that will bring honor and glory to his name. Now and forever. Amen. Have a good week, and we'll see you next time.